they gone. Okay. What up, y'all? It's Leslie, a.k.a. Mrs. Speak from the Heart, where I'm giving you all things speech, language, and life, when in reality, she's actually doing it. I'm just here. I am not a licensed or certified speech language pathologist. She is, and we're happy together, collectively happy that y'all here. Tune into the newest video. Ah! All right, so let's jump right into it today. You jump it in. That was my jump. Okay, right, I got ahead. you. So today's video is gonna be part two of the cranial nerve exam video. So last July, I know it's been a long time, y'all, I uploaded part one, which we covered cranial nerves five and seven, so trigeminal and facial nerve. And we reviewed how both of those have sensory and motor components. And I also showed you how to assess for those uh, in terms of the, the function of both of those cranial nerves. So. Today, we have two more nerves for y'all. Cranial nerves nine and 10, which we will talk a little bit about their functions and also how to test for those with your patients. So get into why cranial nerve exam is so important. Can you tell us why? Not really. <laughs> well, cranial nerve is especially important because it helps us to learn a little bit more about the diagnosis of the patient. So differential diagnosis between different types of motor speech disorders and helping us to confirm diagnosis based on the location of the lesion or injury. It also helps us to know exactly what we're gonna be looking for in an instrumental assessment or if an instrumental assessment is appropriate. So if we see or hear X on a cranial nerve exam, we know to probably expect Y on the instrumental assessment or a modified bearing swallow study. So this is not an end all be all. You should not do a cranial nerve exam and make assumptions about pharyngeal contraction, about you know sensation during the swallow. You shouldn't be able to make those types of conclusions from a cranial nerve exam, but it helps you to get a little bit closer as to what's going on and what we're gonna do about it as speech therapy. So we are going to talk about the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is cranial nerve nine. Glossopharyngeal has both motor and sensory components, and we're gonna talk a little bit about those today. Well, it is responsible for pharyngeal constriction. It's responsible for velar elevation during the swallow and for speech, so that is especially important for preventing nasal regurgitation. It is also responsible for taste and sensation on the posterior one-third of the tongue. So when we eat something, we have a bolus, as soon as it hits the posterior one-third of the tongue, your body's like, oh, time to get ready to initiate the swallow, and then the swallow starts. So you can tell that's, that's really important. So let's talk about how you would assess sensory um, innervation and the component of the glossopharyngeal nerve. So we have our lovely patient today. And for the purpose of this video, since I did something similar in the last video, I am not going to show you how to test for taste. So we talked about that for cranial nerve seven and how you might would assess for taste. And to be honest, I don't always do that in my cranial nerve exams unless the patient's reporting like, hey, I've had such a huge change in my taste. I can't taste things on the back of my tongue, on the front of my tongue. Then I would go through you know, have four different tastes, so salty, sweet, bitter, sour. A tooth that you would probably have in the clinical setting and dipping that tooth that in those different flavors and putting it on the back of the patient's tongue to see if they can distinguish the different types of taste. Now, another thing that you could do just to assess sensation is to use a tooth that or a gloved finger. Uh, I would probably use a tooth that just, especially if the patient has a really intense gag reflex and just kind of gently swiping the base of the tongue if you can, like the fascial pillars. I wouldn't go to the tonsils. I mean, some people just have really um, <laughs> intense. That's since, a little much. It, right, it is a little mm. much. But at least like the posterior one third of the tongue. You don't have to get your ruler out, but I would just instruct the patient, can you open your mouth for me? I'm just gonna touch the back of your tongue, okay? So I, let's just imagine my fingers are too thick. I'm not gonna actually it's COVID. Make sure you wash your hands, y'all. We are not sponsored by Purell. <laughs> so, and I would just, just kind of gently rub on the back of the tongue. So again, you don't want to get to um, the tonsils. You're not trying to 
have the patient gag. I don't assess gag reflex. Some people don't have a gag reflex, but you just want to see if there's sensation back there and that the patient, you touching the them? patient is sensate in the back of the tongue. Diving into our next nerve, we have the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve, baby, is like the king of, <laughs> what? It is, it's like the king of all the cranial nerves. Vagus is controlling so many of just our involuntary actions from here to all the way down. So just to kind of give you an overview of what the vagus nerve is controlling. Vagus nerve is controlling velopharyngeal closure. It's controlling vocal fold approximation or adduction, especially for airway protection during the swallow. It is controlling peristalsis of the esophagus. That is an, that's an involuntary function that, I mean, obviously we have nothing to do with that. And it's also responsible for PES opening, which is the pharyng pharyngoesophageal segment relaxation and opening. So allowing food, drink, the bolus to enter into the esophagus. So the vagus nerve has a lot of important functions, especially for the pharyngeal and the esophageal portion of the swallow. So. As you can tell, there is going to be a limit to how much we can test in a cranial nerve exam, but I'm gonna at least show you what you can look for um, so that you know what's going on and what to maybe look for in an instrumental assessment. So for the motor component of vagus, we're also going to combine that with the motor component of the glossopharyngeal nerve as well. So I'm gonna be showing you kind of how to assess both. Um, so that way, again, you know exactly what you're looking for. So let's jump right into it. What we're going to do first is have the patient open their mouth and what you want to do, you're just looking for symmetry or any weakness of the velum or the soft palate. So open your mouth for me. All right. So this patient right now has a lot of tone in the base of the tongue. So she's purposely holding her tongue in like a retracted position. So I can't see the velum. In that case, I would recommend again, either using your tooth that or a tongue depressor to literally push and squish the tongue down so that you can visualize the velum. So let's just pretend I have a tongue depressor. Yep, perfect. All right, you're looking for symmetry. Looks really good. <laughs> All right, now you're gonna have the patient just give you an ah. What you're looking for here is velar elevation. So when the patient is phonating on this sound, the velum should elevate. Closing off the pat or closing off the air escape to the nasal cavity, and then as soon as they stop, the velum should depress. So I'm gonna have you just hold out ah, uh, uh, perfect, good. And then this is not typical, but it's just something I do. I have the patient give me three staccato ah uh, ah uh, ah. Uh. What I'm looking for is velar elevation, depression, elevation, depression, elevation, depression. All right, ah uh, ah uh, ah. Uh. Uh, uh, uh. Good, very nice. Um, another area that you would want to look for is nasality and resonance, uh, which also tells you a lot about uh, velopharyngeal closure during the production of non-nasal sounds. Now, I don't typically do this unless I'm hearing some type of uh, change in resonance or something that's kind of out of the ordinary, so like hypernasality. And so what I typically will have the patient do is still give me an ah, so ah is like the magic sound when testing for these nerves, while having the nose occluded, assuming that they have the motor function to be able to do that. So what I'm gonna have you do, I want you to hold out ah, but I want you to plug your nose. Ah. Ah. Good, yep. If the patient is hypernasal or has some type of issue with velopharyngeal closure, they wouldn't be able to make that sound because all the sound would be trying to come through the nose, all the air flow is trying to come through the nose. Um, so yeah, that's why we do that. Yeah, interesting, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so our patient's good. Good oral resonance, which is what we want. And so the last thing that we will do to assess for, like I said, motor for vagus and glossopharyngeal is vocal quality. Now, take this with a grain of salt. Some people are naturally hoarse, some people actually have a voice disorder, like a muscle tension dysphonia. So what you hear may not be indicative of like vocal fold paralysis. So again, you wanna take this with a grain of salt and you wanna write what you note know in your report and then just being able to confirm that with maybe an ENT exam or what you see on the instrumental assessment. So I'm just gonna have my patient again, just hold out a nice long, ah. Uh, 
Uh, okay, perfect. So obviously our patient is intact, but if you heard anything like hoarseness, extreme breathiness, uh, vocal instability or vocal tremor, those are things that you would want to note. Write that in your report and then determine what the next you know, appropriate recommendation would be. So cranial nerves nine and 10 are very simple to assess in the, like, in the realm of a cranial nerve exam because there's so much that we can't see. And it's easy to make assumptions based on what you see and what you hear or what you don't see and what you don't hear, but only reporting what you see, okay? Only documenting what you see and what you hear. Don't make assumptions. And then again, making that appropriate recommendation for instrumental examination or ENT or you know whatever it is that you feel like is next. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was helpful. If you have questions, make sure you comment them down below. If you want to see something or maybe I didn't explain something in the best way, you know, let me know that as well. I think it's just so important to be able to see a cranial nerve exam so that way when you do it, you just feel a little bit more comfortable. It can be a little awkward when you're like, okay, what comes next? What nerve am I assessing? I am purposely going through the nerves in chronological order because that's how I do my cranial nerve exams. I have five, seven, nine, 10, 12, and all of my cranial nerve exams are performed that way. So we skipped some, okay? Some of them are not speech swallow specific. Okay, I was like, <laughs> five, seven, you skipped six. The next video, we will be doing cranial nerve 12, which is hypoglossal. And then also at that time, I will be doing a full cranial nerve exam at the end of that video so you can see everything all together. So make sure you stay tuned. Yes, do you have a question? Am I getting paid for that? Yeah, then Chipotle. So y'all heard it. <laughs> <laughs> make sure you stay tuned make sure you subscribe to my channel that just I, I, I can't believe how much we've grown we have such a great big speak from the heart family and I hope that you like this type of content turn on the notification bell like this video go visit my website and yeah I'll see you in the next one created by yours truly yes created by yours truly thank you so much for watching thank you to our lovely patient today and we'll see you in the next one Bye.